Hi, everybody. <clears throat> We're going to get started. If everybody would like to take their seats. <laughs> okay, thanks everyone for, uh, for joining us tonight. My name is Wayne Daly. I'm the co founder of the Architectural Association's imprint, Bedford Press. Um, we're delighted to have our guests here tonight to share two recent projects which have analyzed the radical architecture movement and its impact on architectural history and specifically the design of entertainment spaces and nightclubs in Italy during the 1960s and 1970s and beyond. Um, we're gonna, we've structured the talk into two parts. Um, firstly, we're going to hear from design historian Catherine Rossi and curator Simitra Upham who were co-curators of the recent ICA exhibition, Radical Disco Architecture and Nightlife in Italy, 1965 to 1975. And following this, photographer Giovanna Silva and editor Chiara Carpenter will discuss their photographic research project, Night Swimming, which is a survey of European nightclubs with a particular focus on Italian clubs, um, which also involves a series of interviews with key figures from the, uh, the period of radical architecture. Night Swimming is also a book that we've just published with Bedford Press, um, which we're launching here tonight. It's available just behind the lecture space for a special launch price of £12, so you can buy a copy afterwards, and I think Chiara and Giovanna will be happy to sign copies. Um, we also have copies of a book that Catherine was a co-editor on, I think, uh, called EP1, The Italian Avant-Garde 1968-76, to published by Sternberg Press, which is also highly recommended and also discounted to, I think, 14 pounds tonight. Um, and uh, so, we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll split the talk into two parts, and then we can take questions from the audience at the end. So I'll hand over to Catherine and Sumitra. Okay. I wish I had a book to talk about. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, thank you, Wayne. Thanks for the invitation. Um, as Wayne says, Kat and I co-curated the ICA exhibition um, Radical Disco Architecture and Nightlife in Italy, 1965 to 1975, which closed um, at the beginning of this year. Those of you that didn't see the show, it was a small archive, archival exhibition that surveyed a little-known period within Italian design history where um, a wave of radical architects began engaging with nightclubs and discos as, as sites for experimentation, but also um, for liberation from social and cultural concerns. Um, many of the architects involved were well-known members of the radical design movement who were interested in more of a kind of expansive idea of, of architecture that was socially engaged um, and that spoke to the rapid changes in the world around them. They saw nightclubs and discos um, they saw potential in nightclubs and discos really to kind of provoke modern, um, kind of modernist traditions surrounding um, architecture uh, through experiments with other disciplines, including music, performance, and technology. So, that work. Um, so the exhibition took place in the reading room, reading room space at the ICA, which is an interesting space with quite a unique agenda, um, for those of you that don't know it. So unlike the main gallery uh, program at the ICA, the, uh, the reading room space tends to spotlight the work of, um, sorry, the, the main galleries tend to spotlight the work of a particular contemporary artist, but the, but the reading room space kind of acts as a, as a laboratory for, for um, testing contemporary ideas across a range of disciplines, architecture, design, contemporary art, um, performance and technology being just some. The program really sets out to offer resonance to moments of uh, radicalism or experimentation that have often been overlooked in cultural history. Um, and at the center of most of these exhibitions is a rare archive um, or collection of ephemera. Um, the program has included a range of ex exhibitions dedicated to things like the work of a radical feminist print collective um, during the second wave feminist movement to shows about 1980s pirate radio, tower block pirate radio in the UK. Um, and then most recently, the exhibition that you'll see in the slide over there, um, Everything is Architecture, Bow Magazine, from the 60s to the 70s, which some of you may have seen. I might have another image. Um, so the ICA has had a, had a long kind of standing interest in discos as, as socially engaged political spaces for experimentation. It's hosted many shows that examine the history of nightlife cultures and has, and I think still 
um, is home to many club nights and kind of underground music events. For example, NTS Radio are their current um, artists in residence. Um, they've hosted kind of various collaborative events with a number of record labels like Ninja Tunes um, and also uh, kind of musical platforms like Boiler Room. <laughs> um, so whilst at the ICA, uh, I came across the project that Kat had curated for the 2014 Venice, Venice Biennale, um, which was an exhibition entitled Space Electronic Then and Now that told the story of space electronic disco in, in Florence that was designed by Grappo 9999 in the late 60s. And Kat's going to speak to you a bit more about that space. And this was um, very much my kind of introduction into Radical Design's relationship with, with nightlife and, and, and disco specifically, and really sparked the beginning of my interest in, in looking at these spaces as architectural. And so I invited Kat to the ICA um, to discuss the potential of facilitating a broader discussion um, through the format of an exhibition on the relationship between architecture and nightlife in Italy during the post-war period. Um, I wanted to find out whether this was a wider movement and whether there were other discos that had be de been designed by radical architects. Um, and if so, who were those architects and, and what did those spaces look like? Um, I think we, we both saw potential in discos as a kind of noctur nocturnal place of utopia. Nightclubs are not obviously, uh, sorry, not often viewed as obviously architectural and tend to kind of often be overlooked within design history or criticism. Um, and so there was an interesting challenge here, really, for us to use the exhibition as a way of kind of combating this social stigma around discos. And so drawing upon Kat's existing research into space electronic and post-war Italian design more generally, we, um, as well as projects like um, Giovanna's and uh, Chiara's, we kind of probed further, um, interviewing architects and raided through articles from the key kind of Italian design press at the time to really investigate this movement more widely. And we came across such rich material right, relating to a number of spaces um, designed by the likes of Super Studio, Grappa Ufo, um, and Uga La Pietra um, that were operating across northern Italy in the 60s and 70s. Um, and a selection of these spaces became the focus uh, of our exhibition at the ICA. And we really kind of set out to explore how these spaces were used to test the limits of architecture in, in, in a way that hadn't been done before. And Kat's going to speak to you a bit about those spaces. So, hi everybody. Um, I thought I'd start by mentioning the origins of both Night Swimming and um, Radical Disco, which is the 2014 Venice Architecture Biennale, where Giovanna and Chiara and I were amongst those who were invited to curate installations for the Monditalia section, which was all about using uh, stories about architecture that said something about Italy past and present. And together, I uh, worked with a team that included um, the interior designer Ben Kelly, who also designed the interior of the Hacienda Club, um, but also a filmmaker called Jilly Booth. And um, we featured this installation called Space Electronic Then and Now. And this is the, this is the disco that, that kicked off the ICA show, but also kicked off my interest in discos, really. Um, it, we also featured it in the Italian avant-garde book that, that Wayne mentioned. So Space Electronic, um, which is what you saw the footage of um, if you were here um, before the talk started. This was a disco, um, as Samita mentioned, thank you, that, um, that opened in Florence in 69 by one of these lesser known groups of the radicals called Gruppo 9999. And it w it's not only fascinating for the fact that its history is interesting, but also the fact that it's still going today. Um, and uh, two of the original um, architects and founders are still involved, still run it, and still go most evenings, even though they're in their 70s. Um, and the installation looked at the idea that the disco is architecturally, physically the same, pretty much unchanged, but what happens inside the space has um, changed. So from the then, in space electronic, then is radical experimentation, and now is a, a kind of mindless commercialism, let's say, at its worst. So the... The ICA show um, was a really nice invitation as an opportunity to broaden my knowledge, um, but also more generally knowledge and understanding of the discos that were designed by members of Radical Design, which was this movement centered in Florence, Milan, and Turin in the 60s and 70s. And they sought um, to transform architecture from a, a dead-end 
commercial modernism into tools for socio-political uh, kind of change. And one of the interesting things about them is that they did so through media and means that were perhaps unconventional, at least for mainstream um, architects. So, for example, they made films, they made publications, um, they also made collages of unrealizable architecture and happenings and events and so on. And it was really this, this quite a well-known focus on paper-based architecture and performance-based architecture that had led me and, and many others to think that there wasn't really a built legacy of the radicals, that they'd never actually built anything. But what the discos has shown is that that actually patently isn't true. So I think it's, it's quite something to realize that you could actually experience the liberatory ideals of radical architecture um, through going to spaces like Space Electronic, or this is um, Bang Bang, designed by Ugo La Pietra in Milan in 68, which was a disco um, which you entered through a shopping boutique. And we'll show a film of this at the end of our, our part of this talk. So I'm just gonna very briefly um, talk through the show and some and the discos that we featured. There were seven in total, um, the earliest of which was the Piper Club, which was also Italy's first disco. And this opened in Rome in 65. It's still going again today. Uh, and it was designed by Manilio Cavalli and two brothers called Francesco and Giancarlo Capolei. And the, this, the Piper, as it was called, was um, a conversion of an ex cinema. I think you can see that, the kind of the idea of it being a cinema in the space. So it was an existing interior-focused space that was really sealed off from the world outside, just like most of the other clubs that we featured. And inside, at the back, you can see there was a stage that was made up of a series of platforms that you could rearrange as you needed, depending on what the night's nice performance was about. And in the 60s and 70s, that stage hosted um, Italian and British bands like Patti Pravo, Genesis, Pink Floyd, um, uh, yeah, and Nilly Queen, or was that, no, Space Electronic was nearly Queen, but not quite for a long reason. <laughs> and then on the walls um, were artworks by people like Andy Warhol and Piero Manzoni and an Italian artist, Claudio Cintoli, that we see here. And then from the ceiling were these um, audiovisual uh, kind of equipment held in metal frame structures. And that's, that, that, these are all quite important details because while the Piper wasn't associated with radical design, the Cavalier and the Capolais, Cavalier and the Capolais um, attempt to create a space that responded to changing social behaviours of a younger generation that up to then had had quite formal dance halls that, that you could go and socialise in. And their attempt to respond to these changes through this quite centreless, informal and communal setup that had um, reconfigurable furnishings that came to life with multimedia technology meant that it was recognised as quite a significant innovation in Italian architecture. And in fact, the Rome Piper, the Rome Disco, sorry, was so popular and so influential that the word Piper became shorthand for this new kind of leisure venue. So in uh, November 66, you get a second so-called Piper opening in Turin. And this, behind this design was um, three Turin architects called Giorgio Ceretti, Riccardo Rosso, and Pietro de Rossi, who would then go on to become a group called Gruppo Strom that would be quite important in radical design as well. And through this club, and also the second club that they did, called Lato Mondo um, in Rimini, which opened a year later in 67, they, they seem to have invented, really, what would become arguably the architectural or built architectural typology of the radicals. So it's the idea of an adaptable and participatory site for multi-sensorial spectacles, um, just in a way like the Piper but with an, in Rome, but with an added political dimension of that it was seen to be a way to liberate man's creativity that was stultified um, in the rhythms of capitalism. And the radicalism of these spaces was recognised at the time. So Peter Cook featured this disco in his 1970 book, Experimental Architecture, um, and he discussed it as a smaller but actually built version of the Fun Palace um, by Cedric Price and Joan Littlewood. And he saw it as an example of how architecture was shifting away from a static, solid architecture to the idea of buildings that changed physically um, in line with changes in use. And then in the late 1960s, you see a few other pipers um, emerging, more, in fact, than we feature in the exhibition. So this is Grupo uh, UFO's club called Bamba Issa, 
um, which is on the Tuscan coast and still exists today, but now it's a luxury hotel. And this is like a beachside restaurant. It looks quite different to this. Um, and this opened in 1969. And um, its first design iteration, in fact, its name was inspired by a Mickey Mouse comic strip. And it, would, it changed for each of the three years that it was open. And then, of course, there's Space Electronic, whose dance floor, as we, that we see here, was host to everything from multimedia experiments to music and theatre performances. So the film was of um, Living Theatre, who were an experimental New York group in the 70s. The dance floor also hosted in the daytime an architectural school. And also, what you can just about see here um, is a vegetable garden. So you could go and lie down amongst cauliflowers and things while uh, music was going on. And the, that parachute canopy is um, the same as you get in a club called Electric Circus in New York, which Andy Warhol was quite involved in, and which these architects went to visit to get inspiration for this. So I've mentioned that these clubs were spreading in number, and that's partly because of repeated appearances in the design and architectural press, but also, crucially, in education. So in um, 1966, at Florence University, which is one of the centers of, of radical activity, there was an architect called Leonardo Savioli. And he um, taught a course in, inspired by Archigram, I think tongue in cheek a bit, that was called Piper Attrezzatura per Tempo Libro. Sorry for any Italians in the room. <laughs> <Don't mean pronunciation. Yeah. laughs> um, and which means Piper Furnishings for Leisure. And the teaching assistants on the course included several architects who had either already designed discos or who would go on to design discos, um, and also students as well. S similarly, a member of um, Super Studio, for example, was on this course. And Savioli explained the rationale for this course in Casabella magazine. And he said it was because the Piper typology, as a typology, was really special because it was an architecture that enabled users to actively participate in the architecture rather than be passively subsumed by, by a kind of built environment. Now, ultimately, um, our project was a small exhibition, one that was great to be involved in, but it could only go so far in telling the story of Radical Disco. And in fact, some of those we featured, we really only scratched the surface of. So this is, um, for example, my final example is Mac 2, which was opened by Super Studio in Florence in 1967, and which closed just a couple of years later. And all we have um, is a Domus magazine article that this is where these images come from. But we thought that the design was so potent that actually that's what informed the design of the exhibition that we did, which Samitra is going to talk about. Yeah. A bit. Um, so, so, yeah, I'm just going to show you a few installation shots from the um, ICA exhibition. Um, so we work with the design studio Julia, which some of you might be aware of, um, very closely on the exhibition design. Um, the space in the reading room was kind of divided into seven environments, essentially, one for each disco that we were focusing on. Um, each disco was represented by one or two large-scale interior images, which you'll see up there. Um, and then beneath these were wall vitrines containing a variety of archival material from architectural drawings to kind of photographs um, and articles from the interna international design press at the time. The space was painted black, um, as you can see, to create a kind of dramatic immersive disco environment. Um, and we used strip LED lighting to enhance this aesthetic that you'll see above those images. Um, we tried to work with the kind of, with the architecture of the space um, itself of the reading room, you, which you kind of enter via descending down a few stairs to create this kind of basement-like club effect. Whether or not that worked, I don't know. Um, the space, as Kat was saying, the space was characterized by the, uh, a pink neon vinyl strip that helped to articulate and give definition to the various discos that we were focusing on. Um, the neon strip was, of course, a nod to the practice of um, Super Studio and the principles that they applied to their Mac 2 um, space. Um, so, yeah, so we were keen to kind of emulate the multidisciplinary, multisensory um, environments of these discos through, through talking about the period um, uh, via a range of media and exhibition formats. That's a good image of Bamba Issa somewhere. Yeah, so in the case of, um, in the case of Bamba Issa, we had a carousel slide projector that projected rare images um, of the interior and exterior of the space and some of the happenings that took place there. 
We also included the uh, original Mickey Mouse comic that Capt was um, talking about to show parallels really between the, the narrative uh, of, this, of the comic and in the story and the visual arrangements of the space. Um, two cube monitors we used to present archival footage of live performances that took place in the various um, discos. So we had around five films in total, mm. I think. So performances of Patti Bravo and Genesis performing um, at Piper Rome, uh, and the Living Theatre performance at Space Electronic that some of you will have seen when you were walking in, um, and a documentary about Bang Bang, which we will show just after I finish speaking. Um, and to, to accompany all of this was a playlist of tracks given to us or kind of curated by Titi Machietto from um, UFO uh, of kind of key songs and tracks that were played, actually played at Bamba Issa um, at the time. And this was kind of a mix of prog rock and kind of, uh, kind of popular soul hits. Uh, so with the advent of nightclubs, closing across the UK, but I guess closing across the globe, we were keen to use these these kind of little known architectural spaces to unravel the, the importance of nightclubs and, and why we should fight to preserve them. That's us. Can I show the... Oh, the film, of course. sarebbe finito. Abbiamo cominciato con il ricordo del Pipe e mi sembra logico finire ancora lì. Siete tutti i miei ospiti. Vi aspetto al Pipe. Ah, fantastico. Che cos'è? Sì, i progettisti. Qual è la struttura del negozio? Il negozio si configura secondo tre eh, ambienti chiaramente distinti. Un ambiente d'arrivo con passaggio diretto al nightclub sottostante, il passaggio immediato è realizzato su una piattaforma mobile, su un piano inclinato, che dovrebbe sottolineare la dicotomia esistente tra l'ambiente del night confuso e caotico, e invece l'ambiente del negozio eh, più chiaro, ordinato e preciso. Ah, fantastico! Che cos'è? È, è un una gioco. cellula, eh, sì, è un gioco, una cellula elettroacustica che col battito delle mani si accende e si spegne. È una porta elettronica che si apre comandata da fotocellule, cioè il cliente che si trova all'esterno guardando attraverso una specie di oblò interrompe un circuito di fotocellule e fa aprire automaticamente la porta. Può avvicinarsi al pannello, può far scendere un cilindro con la merce. Si sale in un locale superiore dove ci sono dei spogliatoi abbastanza caratterizzati da un insieme di specchi che moltiplicano la possibilità di visione, che arricchiscono lo spettacolo della persona che si sta cambiando o che si sta... C'è anche un jukebox, cioè quindi la possibilità di controllare e di avere un certo tipo di musica a seconda delle caratteristiche del fruitore. Quando entra qui dentro, che effetto prova? Che sensazione? Allucinante. Mi sembra di essere, non so, sulla luna, per esempio. Sulla? Luna. 
luna. Es una luna. Sí. Tú, guarda, 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 es extraño, ¿eh? Es un juego. No es un juego, es vero. Eh, eh, purtroppo vivimos en una época extrañísima. Sí. Eh, la época de Yeye, eh, finita. ¿Y so, la... qué época es? Es eh, la época de la cuarta dimensión. ¿Ah, sí? Eh, sí, sí, sí. ¿No es? Cioè è una dimensione che non è né la terza né la quinta, è la quarta. Ah. Da un senso di un, di un balletto astratto in una notte d'estate con Picasso che sta morendo, per esempio. Okay, it's my turn. Uh, let me check. It's in loop or I have to play? I will do. Maybe I have to. Is it possible to set up in loop? Uh, night swimming has been for me mostly an experience because uh, I've never been in a discotheque before I was assigned this research, but uh, in the meanwhile, I got to get up to date, if not an expert <laughs> <laughs> in this topic. So uh, how it was started, uh, you might wonder. In uh, December 2013, OMA called me saying that they needed a photographic work for the, about discotheque for the section Monditalia in the um, architectural Venice Biennale. And there, there wasn't a specific request. We were free to do whatever we want. Of course, the work has to include photographs because uh, I'm a photographer after all. And uh, the fact is uh, they, uh, there were other projects focused on nightlife as Catherine about space electronic, but they, they would like to have also a project uh, with all the discotheques uh, in Italy. And um, so um, I prefer to tell a story about discotheque instead of like uh, shooting pictures. This is why I involved Chiara Carpenter and uh, working together, the project bec uh, became a series of interviews and uh, a collection of books. There is a, a quite broad literature on uh, this uh, theme. Uh, some of these books uh, are became rare for collection, and most of them are very, very specific. And uh, as we went uh, on reading, we understood that the material was fragmented um, geographically wise and temporarily wise speaking, and that's why we decided that uh, uh, our project uh, should cover as much as possible the whole uh, spectrum from 60 until now and uh, uh, cover the as much as possible, the whole country. We are talking about Italy at the moment. Uh, and luckily, we could uh, work on the project for only four months, uh, starting in December and finishing in May. And uh, therefore, the um, seaside disco and the disco from the southern of Italy were still closed because they normally they open during the, the season, I mean, the summer. Uh, we decided to uh, start with the book that stylistically strokes us uh, the most. It's a discotheque from uh, Fulvio Ferrari. It's a description of five discotheques, uh, Lutrario by Carlo Mollino in Turin from the late 50s until Grifone in Bolzano, that is more like a nightclub than uh, a discotheque. Fulvio Ferrari is the owner of Casa Mollino. The Casa Mollino is the, uh, the house of Carlo Mollino, the Italian designer. But he is also an architectural specialist. When uh, all this discotheque um, started to shut down or be renewed, Lutrario, the discotheque designed by Carlo Mollino, still exists and still works as a ballera, a barroom. 
but um, it was uh, partially refurbished. Uh, Fulvio started buying all the pieces uh, uh, designed by architects and um, collecting them. So we owe it to uh, him if all this object has been saved. And our first interview, uh, which was with him, lasted seven hours. And uh, he told us the whole story, uh, starting from Turin, that is his city. So he told us how it happened that Piero De Rossi, the architect of uh, Piper in Turin, um, had gone from being uh, simply his architect in uh, becoming also the owner of uh, Piper in Turin with his wife, up to the lights designed by Bruno Munari for the club and the musical uh, uh, staircase, uh, which would sound when people came down the stair. So he gave us the first impression of uh, the world of uh, Architettura Radicale in Turin. And then, um, let's say, uh, he introduced us to the concept of Piper. That uh, for us is a, a very uh, brand new concept uh, um, compared to the uh, idea of discotheque now. Because I think uh, uh, um, the Piper is uh, completely different from the idea of uh, a discotheque because the, pe the people there are going to the Piper because it was the Piper. The crowd in there it, uh, was always the same and uh, there was also a place for artistic creation. This is a huge difference from nowadays because uh, this kind of discotheque doesn't exist anymore. The people now, from my experience, uh, are going to clubs because of the music or following certain DJs, not for the club itself. And uh, of course, this is a problem at the time, and um, the discotheques in Italy, but I think everywhere, are experiencing um, a crisis, and they are shut down because of that, because the art, um, uh, the, the, the people pr prefer to go in places that are not designed for being a discotheque, like industrial space or museum for one night, because the important is the music and not the place. So the place is changing every now and then. And then now, um, Fulvio Ferrari introduced us to Piero De Rossi, and uh, he told us the whole story, how he was commissioned for the Piper in Turin, and how he decided to run the place in order to save it, and how this turned him in, uh, to the, um, into the architect of discotheque. So he was commissioned of also of um, being the architect of Altromondo, and of the 14th Triennale Temporary Theater that uh, is inspired of, uh, of an idea of leisure. And then um, Fulvio introduced us also to Franco Aldrito from Studio 65, Studio 65. Uh, he designed two discotheques in two places close to Turin. The first one uh, is Barbarella, and the second one is the flashback that is like a kind of postmodern because it's the union of like, um, Pyramid, uh, Greek temple, and the capital, so very postmodern. <laughs> and um, of course, this place doesn't exist anymore. So, for that, when we started to work on the project for the Biennale, we decided to collect the material, as also Catherine does. And when I was seeing uh, the images, it's very close to the installation we made, with also with the slide projection and the, uh, the video from the 80s, because this is the, the also the uh, architectural setup of that disco, and they will, we tried to reply the same uh, uh, setup in our installation at the Biennale. Anyway, um, this, is, this was in Turin in the late 60s, but of course what happened in, uh, in Turin in the late 60s happened also in the rest of uh, Italy. Uh, in Rome, there was a Piper that maybe the Piper in Rome for us was more commercial. Uh, there was uh, an architect, two architects that are not from the Architettura Radicale. And for uh, our um, work, we interviewed Patti Bravo, that in Italy is very famous, and uh, she's uh, known as the girl from Piper. And uh, we understood that Piper, maybe in Rome, um, was in the right place in the right moment. Uh, as uh, Catherine told uh, before, Pink Floyd played there, Genesis played there. So it was a place where the VIP people would like to go. And for the um, Roman scene, we interview also Gianni De Michelis, that is a famous Italian politician. Uh, he was the foreign uh, 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 minister during the Craxi cabinet. And uh, anyway, he was uh, in our political scene for more than 50 years. 
but uh, in uh, 1988 he wrote a book uh, and the title of the book is uh, Dove andiamo a ballare questa sera? Where are we going to dance tonight? That is uh, like a guide of discotheque with a description of more than 250 disco. He hired the four girls and uh, he turned them around Italy writing uh, um, reviews and compiling charts. It's, it's amazing. It's one of the best books I ever had. And uh, this is for the scene uh, in Rome. And then what happened? Um, Saturday Night Fever uh, became a cult movie. Uh, it's not a surprise that every book we read about the topic uh, uh, set up uh, this film as a rapture, as a turn in terms of fashion and lifestyle. And um, so nightlife spreads everywhere. Discotheque appear all over the country. And the, um, let's say, Adriatic Coast phenomenon started. Uh, for Adriatic Coast, uh, in Italy, we, um, we meant um, this trip from uh, Gabice Mare until uh, Cervia, that is uh, our, like, Las Vegas. And uh, it was a place where there was nothing, but still they managed to bid everything with a business, it, Italian business attitude. So they, uh, they design club that suits uh, every taste, like Rokatsan, that despite his name is a place for housewife, whose motto uh, was safe as milk, until uh, uh, Slegola and uh, Aleph that are more for rock and roll and, uh, and new wave. But um, this place, I photographed three places that are icons of this uh, Riviera Adriatica coast. Um, and um, are also a synthesis of, let's say, vernacular architectural style, or style of those discos. The first one was Altromondo, with this neon light that uh, has this idea of uh, futuristic space shuttle uh, style. And then uh, there was the um, Cocorico, that is a completely different world with this uh, pyramid, with mi also with mystical symbols. And then there was the Baia Imperiale, that is uh, like um, a random uh, neoclassicism that unifies uh, a sphinx with Dante and Marco Aurelio status overlooking the swimming pool. But I have to say that these places are also a place for cultural life, because uh, are places where um, known actors were perform uh, performing their first uh, artworks, performance that now we can see in museum. For instance, uh, at Cocorico, um, Teddy Bear, that uh, it was uh, um, uh, a, the a theater group, uh, organized this performance with naked guys in a glass case full of flies, or Associates uh, Raffaello Sanzio, a uh, piece of meat hanging from the ceiling. There was a morphine uh, that uh, was a private section with, uh, where r poetry reading uh, uh, taking place and where the bartender was Isabella Santa Croce, that is a famous Italian writer at the moment. So uh, the difference in between now and uh, uh, at that time is that there were not only discotheques, but place for young people to experiment their own way of life. And this is completely different from the idea of discotheque uh, nowadays. And uh, of course, uh, also in Florence, we have the same uh, attitude. In Florence, there was the Manila that uh, changed the design uh, every year uh, from Manila Nilo, designed uh, with uh, an Egyptian style, to Manila Garage, uh, passing through Manila Italia. And then in Florence, there was also the Tenax that still uh, works as a uh, Maybe it's the most important discotheque uh, in Italy at the moment. And then um, there was also Milan, of course, and in Milano there was the plastic. In my opinion, I'm from Milan and uh, I'm a, a user of uh, plastic. The plastic, uh, it was in the right place at the right moment because uh, uh, during the 80s there was in Milan the boom of the fashion and Grace Jones and the Warhol Keith Haring were passing through Milan. So for that, plastic was so important at that time uh, in Italy. And it still exists as a, as a discotheque, uh, even if uh, uh, adding the um, dimension of a real discotheque is more like a nightclub. And then in the 90s, we imported all the movement from uh, Europe. So we imported the gabbers from Netherlands, and ravers from um, London and from uh, England. 
so the scene comp uh, changed and uh, it was um, normal at the time to go to to two or three, uh, three clubs in one night, so across the country. So there were places like Duple Paura, that is in Versilia, in the middle of uh, nowhere, but uh, it became famous because it, it was in between Florence, Liguria, and Emilia Romagna. So all the people have to pass through this place, and they built a discotheque for them for like uh, the after, after all the movement uh, across Italy. Of course, now the discotheque uh, in Italy, I don't know, in the rest of Europe, um, are experiencing a tough period. And I think uh, the reasons are mainly economical and cultural. Economical because uh, there has been a crisis. Of, of course, this crisis involved also the world of discotheque because the customers are, are not willing anymore to spend so much money. They are not willing anymore to travel, if not for a good reason. And uh, if they had to travel, they prefer to take an easy jet flight and go to Berlin where the nightlife is more sparkling than uh, Milan or Italy in general. And uh, also the cachet of the DJ uh, got up uh, uh, so much that the medium sized discotheque cannot afford that anymore. So the first reason is economical. The second one I think is cultural. It's my opinion. I, I'm not sure that it's, it's true, but the fact is, uh, the people now are following the music and the DJs, so the, the, the space is not so important anymore. So, as I told before, maybe um, they are preferred to go in hybrid space that are not designed for being a discotheque, as, such as industrial space occupy legally for one night. So, in that case, it's like uh, an evolution of rave party. At that time, in the 90s, they occupied uh, industrial space for one night illegally and now that space are for music as uh, we saw in Berlin but for the Europe uh, part Chiara will tell you and um, and then also because also museum of course you can rent a, a museum for one night and doing um, like let's say a discotheque for one night so um, this is uh, like the first um, story of the Italian discotheque, very, very short and briefly um, part of the first part that it was for the Biennale. Then we met Wayne and Zach and we decided to do a book also about the other part of discotheque. So we went to Berlin, to Paris, to London and to Barcelona to have also another idea of all the discotheque in Europe. Uh, I think it's your turn. <laughs> Grazie. <laughs> well, the, this transformation of the night scene happened everywhere in Europe, and that is why we felt the need to expand our research and, and see what is going on um, everywhere else. Uh, some of the stories are the same, as you might have noticed too and but this is no surprise because already back in the 60s uh, the most experimental clubs managed to get people over to play from from the uk as you, s you already mentioned pink floyd genesis and of course this kept on going on and this generated uh, all sort of contamination. So of course on a musical level and on a technological level and, and of course somehow also in the architectonical influences that uh, discotheques started to have on each other. And uh, Giovanna already mentioned the influences of the British rave scene and on the, of the Dutch gabber scene on the Italian world of discos. And Catherine already mentioned uh, how uh, actually 9999 decided to set up the Space Electronic in Firenze after their trip to the US where they visited several clubs and the one that struck them the most was the um, electric circles in Greenwich Village, where they saw these like curtains hanging from the ceiling with incredible projections, and the light show was created by Andy Warhol while Velvet Underground were playing. So I guess I mean this was this must have been really 
an inspiration coming from like Italy in the 60s. Uh, but um, so I mean that the, the, the stories which started we started the beginning, which is the Italian one, uh, went on and on different like ways, but somehow it happened everywhere in, in Europe. So um, when we approached uh, the rest of the research, we chose four cities, which were Berlin, London, Paris, and Barcelona, so four capitals, and with really different uh, nightlife scenes. Uh, I must say it was a lot more difficult for us to choose the clubs to photographs in Europe. Uh, but what we did was uh, researching all the publications we could find and once again interviewing one of our experts, let's say, um, who is um, a guy who goes under the name of Simone KK, so Simone KK, who describes himself as a club aficionado. And I must say actually he is because he's been almost in every club in Europe for the past 25 years. So uh, he works in a bank and is an IT technician, but... Um, <laughs> But um, yeah, all his free times, it goes around discos and he actually has a, a web zine uh, where he talks about all the clubs, so. He has also a pin, I was there. <laughs> <laughs> He's really always there, I mean. And um, following his tips and, and what we found in, in the, um, in all the books we read. Uh, we finally managed to, to get down to a selection. Uh, the focus was, of course, still on the space, but uh, we also thought it was interesting to pick some of the clubs which turned out to be really important for the history of the nightlife in Europe. And um, because we wanted uh, to photograph the state of the art in, in, in Europe today. Uh, so the design of the architectonical spaces, uh, which are meant for dancing, uh, is continuously changing. I mean, discotheques are building, which are changing all the time, because they have to adjust to fashion on one side, but also on techno the progress in technology of sound and, and, and lightning and of course to the music. I mean, the clubs have changed a lot with the evolution of, of the music and of the drug. I mean, it's all, it, it all went on together in a way. Um, until the turn of the millennium, uh, discotheques were buildings which were always uh, or almost always uh, commissioned to architects. And in the 60s, they were free to do whatever they wanted. I mean, all the, the people, the, all the architects we interviewed in Italy told us that being assigned uh, the, the design of a, an, a discotheque was one of the best thing ever because you, you could really like do whatever you wanted. But then, of course, uh, with time, uh, architects had to respect all sort of regulations which got stricter every year. So, I mean, nowadays it's not that free anymore. And most of the clubs we picked in Europe have uh, recent history. So they, they, I mean, it, most of them are like from the 80s on. So they adjusted to current needs a lot easier than those we photographed in, in, in Italy, which are, I must say, sort of the dinosaurs of uh, Italian history of, of clubs. Uh, but maybe I should finally talk about the book a bit. <laughs> As Giovanna said at the beginning, um, we, we had the same approach that we had for the installation in the Biennale, so uh, we didn't want it to be, to be strictly a photo book. Uh, so we wanted to have texts and photos to, to work together. And the uh, photo selection um, 
is made per association. So the photos are, are, I mean, the clubs in the photos are not related geographically or stylistically. It's really like image association. Uh, the first discussion we had was whether we should photograph them empty or with people. Uh, after the first appointments to, to, to shoot clubs, we realized that uh, the crowd actually erased the very concept of space. So uh, we decided to do both. So we, what we were trying to do was to get an appointment just before the opening of, of the discotheque so that we could uh, shoot the place when it was empty and then people started to come in. So we also got pictures with, with people. And the second discussion was whether we should also include uh, photographs which were taken with, with the cleaning light. Uh, we were once told that, it's, now you see what, <laughs> I mean, at, at the end we decided to, to keep some of them all because some of them are really interesting even if, even if they're shot with uh, the cleaning lights. But we were once told in one of the first visit, I think at the Piper in Rome, that uh, discotheques are old like old ladies and they should never seen without their makeup on. <laughs> and what they actually meant is that you should never see a disco when the light mm. system is not working because it looks really, really ugly generally. <laughs> um, so uh, the... Um, the photographs of the space uh, in the book are always with a frame, with a white frame, while the photograph of people are always full bleed and they're used like uh, an interlude in the sequence of the photograph of space. And in between the sequence, uh, there are also um, three essays which we commissioned uh, the first one is written by Paul Steve, who is actually down there. <laughs> and um, he writes about the importance of um, the development of lightning technology and for the design of clubs. And the second one is written by Ippolito Pestalini Lafarelli, who is a partner of OMA and also the person who's responsible for us for all this because he's the one who invited Giovanna at the Biennale. And the third one is <laughs> Yeah, now you're a party animal. <laughs> <laughs> and the third one is written by Max Dax, who's a music journalist and DJ and is the one who introduced us to the whole Berlin scene and which turned out to be the most interesting. I mean, the thing is that you never get bored in, in Berlin because things are constantly changing and that seems to be what makes the trick now. I mean, we, we get bored too easily and is generally like our society and, and this shows also in, in, in discotheques. Um, at the end of the photographic section, there's the section with the interviews we collected for the um, Biennale installation. And it's their interviews to architects who design discos, DJs, art directors, and club owners, who were all asked to focus on the concept of space. Of course, this turned out in really different ways. I mean, we, we found out that people involved in, the war, in this world are all really egocentric, so they tend to talk about themselves a lot more than, than about like space, but very long interviewed could be <laughs> somehow re resumed in a description of the space, how the space changed. And the last section, uh, which is at the end of the book, but uh, it is really important to us. It's the section with which we call bibliography, even though it's constructed with images and it collects the covers and some internal pages of some of the books we used in our research. And we think it's really important on one side because the 
the layout and the design of this book is strongly related to the period they were published. So somehow the design of the disco and the design of these books is, are really connected. And on the other side, uh, this section is really important because most of these beautiful discos that have been built in the 60s, 70s, 80s, also 90s, don't exist anymore. They've been either destroyed or refurbished. And the only way to, to be able to see them is living through one of these books. So that is why we, we decided not to make a list of titles, but we wanted the actual images. Um, so I don't actually have much else to say. Do you want to add anything? No. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, we have a, l a lot of uh, things to, to, because we spend one year every weekend, we had to take an EasyJet flight, so we are part of the EasyJet culture, <laughs> I have to say, and go there. And for me, of course, it was also a nightmare, because normally uh, I go to sleep at midnight, <laughs> so I have to stay awake until midnight and then go out, <laughs> and then start to take pictures of this place. And of course, uh, as Chiara told before, uh, at the very beginning, the place were empty, and then the people are coming. They were drinking and taking drugs, and we were the only two sober person <laughs> in the, <laughs> the discotheque. So you can see all the world changing around you, and you are there with the tripod and the camera, trying to uh, take the right picture in, at the right moment. Also, because it's very di I, all the images I took, I took with a digital camera, and it's not easy because the light uh, are changing every every second. So I study architecture and I, I used to work for architectural magazine for like eight years. But of course, this was the first time that I really understood the difference in between the space and the space with people. And uh, as Chiara told, when the people are inside the space, uh, you, uh, you lose the idea of the space. You can only focus on the people dancing there. So for that, we decided that we have to collect the, um, the photographs with the empty space and the photographs of the people. Because it's the same space, but completely different. And for, in, for my opinion, this is very uh, important if you are doing a research on the architectural space of discotheque. Because the light and the people are changing the space. And maybe it's the first time that I really understood the importance of the people in the, in the space. So. Well, if you have of course, any uh, question, we're here. <laughs> Which is the us. best club uh, in Europe, <laughs> <laughs> or something like Which this? Which don't know. <laughs> no, for, uh, I think it's in, in Berlin. <laughs> Thank you. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? I can come to you with the microphone. I maybe have one question, perhaps more so for Catherine and Sumitra, um, about the legacy of radical architecture, um, if it extended beyond, beyond Italy, beyond Europe. I mean, we've, we've spoken about some other examples in uh, European capitals, but if there's a kind of uh, a, a legacy beyond um, the research that you've looked at. Yeah, the, the, there is a legacy of radical architecture, certainly, as a movement. It's seen as highly influential, and you know, people like Rem Koolhouse kind of citing it in their work. But I, I'd always thought of that legacy as being in terms of the, the kind of spectacular image making and the kind of and the ideas that you would access through books and exhibitions and that kind of thing. So um, I think, actually, that for me, I'd, I'd want to, to look again at that legacy and think about it, well, what happens actually if you went to those spaces and experienced the architecture itself, then that, that would surely have a different kind of impact on your work, one that I haven't traced or wouldn't even know how to start to trace in a sense. So I think this changes the idea of what kind of legacy they had, actually, even to people who weren't part of the radicals, so to other musicians and, and club owners and that kind of thing. Any other questions? Okay, well, I'd just like to say thank you very much to Sumitra, Catherine, Chiara, and Giovanna. Thank you. Very much appreciated. A few round of applause. Um, as I said earlier, night swimming is for sale.